Well, here we are, the end of the decade. Despite how existentially terrifying it is to realize that an entire decade of your life is over, it's important to realize the most important thing, this was a good decade for animation. Seriously, from 2010 onwards, we've seen some of the greatest cartoons ever made, I would say of all time. The 2010s saw a rise of darker cartoons, cartoons that weren't afraid to tell a deeper story. And in turn, we were left with one of the greatest decades in animation. So today, let's give credit where credit is due. Guys, I'm Nemo, and I'm joined with my co-hosts. I'm Ultrick Vox. And my name is Tom. As we attempt to count down the top 25 cartoons of the past decade. This is in no particular order, okay? We're not saying any shows better or worse because that's subjective and everyone has their own opinions. We are just saying out of all the cartoons that aired this decade, these are the top 25. So without further ado, let's get started. <laughs> So what if you took Phineas and Ferb, but instead of Phineas and Ferb, you follow a story about a kid who sounds like Weird Al, has really bad luck, but a really positive attitude. Then you have Milo Murphy's Law, which I say because not only is this show created by Dan and Swampy, the creators of Phineas and Ferb, resulting in the show having a very similar writing style and sense of humor, but it also exists in the same universe as Phineas and Ferb. And I feel that as a result, they are more experienced and refined, offering more potential with this show that's yet to be fully realized. Milo Murphy's Law was coming into a world with different expectations. There would be more structure, more continuity, more focus on narrative, and through that, Milo Murphy's Law was offering a modern story from the same universe as Phineas and Ferb, which is awesome. As of right now, after only a few seasons, it seems like the life cycle of Milo Murphy's Law might be over, when I honestly believe it has a lot more steam left, and a lot more potential as far as the story goes. It's done a lot in the time it's had, creating characters, relationships, and building up to high stakes adventures, and who's to say they couldn't do it again? Just like Dan and Swampy said in that rap song. I honestly think with time, Milo would be capable surpassing Phineas and Ferb, but unfortunately, we probably won't get to see that. It wouldn't be the only show that's ended seemingly abruptly and had a lot more to offer, but no matter what, Milo Murphy's Law was definitely a highlight in the last decade of animation. When it comes to unique and original animation, no one takes more risks than Netflix. And that is totally the case with Love, Death, and Robots. I remember first hearing about this series and I wasn't even remotely excited for it. It just seemed kind of average. And even watching the very first episode, I'm like, okay, well, this isn't anything special. But Love, Death, and Robots is something that deserves to be watched in its entirety because it is the definition of a mixed bag. If I were to describe Love, Death, and Robots, I would say that it is just ultimately a love letter to animation as a genre. It's an anthology series, meaning each and every episode is a different story, a different world, a different character. But it also means that every episode is a uniquely different animation style, and this is where Love, Death, and Robots truly shines through. Every episode completely exists on its own, independent of each other, in the absolute best way. You have no idea what you're gonna get every time you watch an episode of Love, Death, and Robots. Episodes like The Witness are claustrophobic and gritty and dark, but also serene and beautiful. Other episodes might be lighthearted adventures about farmers in mech suits fighting aliens. Other episodes like Zima Blue are beautiful, introspective art pieces telling us stories you didn't even know you wanted to hear. My point is, Love, Death, and Robots is all over the place in the best way. And because of Netflix, it's allowed to be as experimental and crazy as it wants. Some episodes are long, while other episodes are just a few minutes. There's no set time length, there's no set anything. It's animation completely unhinged, and it's amazing. Love, Death, and Robots just encapsulates everything that's great about animation right now, and everything that animation is capable of in this moment in time. But it's also a representation of where animation is going into the next century and where it could go. We finally exist in a world where something like Love, Death, and Robots, an experimental animated anthology series, is allowed to thrive and exist. And with the news of it getting confirmed for a second season, I'm just more than excited to see where this goes. Love, Death, and Robots is something that couldn't have existed five years ago, ten years ago, but here we are, and it's amazing. That's why it's definitely worth a watch. Miraculous Ladybug and Cat Noir is one of those shows that I think is really stupid, but I just can't stop watching it. Despite having threads of continuity, the show doesn't have much of a coherent overarching plot, and the way that episodes are released can make it really difficult to keep up with it. But they found a simple formula that can be twisted and recontextualized in so many ways that you can't help but stay invested. And the moments where the writing needs to be strong, it usually delivers. Of course, there are a lot of criticisms you can bring up against the show, but the draws 
cause and substance of the show is solid. It has an X factor and provides something conceptually that no other story does, or at least no other story executes this well. That concept being the dynamic between the main character and her co-star, and their hero identities versus their secret identities. Marinette is Ladybug, who Cat Noir is in love with, and Cat Noir's Adrian, who Marinette is in love with. But they don't know each other's secret identities, despite the fact that it's really, really obvious, so they end up thirsting after each other without even realizing it. The whole concept of the show is so stupid, but so well executed that it pulls you in. The idea of two characters who interact with each other constantly being madly in love but not knowing it doesn't sound like it would make for such a compelling experience, and yet, here we are. Really what it is, is they manage to take fanfiction elements and integrate them into a cartoon in a way that works. So even if fanfiction isn't your thing, it's just all the drama and BS from that in a more universal medium and with more professional presentation. Also, the show just makes me happy to watch. It's pure and simple and knows when to bring it. It's not extremely ambitious, but it does what it does and does it well. The 2010s kicked off with one of the strongest action adventure shows I've ever laid my eyes on, Symbionic Titan. And I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that despite being an action cartoon, Gunny Tratikoski always did his best to make sure the focus of the show were the characters. Lance, Alana, and Octus are one of the best trios to exist in animation, no room for debate. Over the short-lived 20-episode run, you see these war refugees who have to pretend to be a family develop into an actual family who depend on each other for strength, guidance, and wisdom. The high school setting is used to its full advantage, turning all the tropes and cliches on its head with a very fun and surprisingly active recurring cast. The action is always sick, whether if it's in a giant robot dealing with the kaiju of the week or hand-to-hand -hand combat primarily with Lance. Symbiote Titan deserves more, and I'm going to keep this entry short because now that the series is available for streaming on Netflix, I want to dedicate a full-length video on why we need to bring it back. Hold this to me. There's a reason this show keeps getting referenced in newer card network properties. If you need to refresh yourself or have never seen it before, if you live in the USA, drop everything except this video and consume it on Netflix. 20 half hour episodes that will leave you wanting more. The Looney Tunes show is one I definitely knew I had to put on this list, and one that I'm not sure a lot of people have even seen. To most people, I wouldn't be surprised if this is just like a vague memory, like, oh yeah, I remember that was like on Cartoon Network in like 2011. But no, I'm here, I'm coming here, I'm, I'm giving this show all the praise it deserves. The Looney Tunes show is one of the greatest cartoons to air in the last decade, for sure. Catch this premise, okay? Take the Looney Tunes characters and make it Seinfeld. That's literally it. It's just a sitcom starring the Looney Tunes characters characters, and that's why it's beautiful. They traded in slapstick humor for real-life situations. Gone are the days of falling anvils. Instead, you get to watch Bugs Bunny try to install a shelf for 22 minutes, and it is glorious. Bugs and Daffy are roommates in this weird universe. Bugs is living off of the royalty money from this carrot chopper kitchen invention that he made like years ago, so he's living the classic sitcom scenario of a house that's way too nice and that he probably shouldn't be able to afford. And yet, basically just follows him and Daffy getting into shenanigans. And a lot of people actually harped on this show for how they portrayed the Looney Tunes characters. I think this is one of the greatest adaptations of the Looney Tunes characters. Bugs has this sort of sarcastic dryness to him that's carried over into every situation. The way I could describe it is he just doesn't give a f in like the best way. And Daffy is classically self-absorbed, but in a way that completely works and doesn't come off as like stereotypical. In fact, he still manages to be lovable. It's a pretty great dynamic because Bugs is able to just put up with a lot of what Daffy does, but he's not afraid to draw the line. Like I keep saying, it's just a classic sitcom dynamic that works in every way. My absolute favorite part of the Looney Tunes show and the part that's an absolute trip is just seeing how they fit all of the other Looney Tunes characters into a real world dynamic. Speedy Gonzalez owns a popular sports bar. Porky Pig at some points like owns a catering company. It handles adult themes in a way that's not overtly raunchy. In fact, it just seems to kind of tackle the monotony of adult life. But there's just something about Bugs on an awkward date with Lola in a grocery store that makes me really appreciate this show for being so out there. I mean, honestly, this was like a huge risk to make, and on paper it sounds weird, but I appreciate it for how bizarre it is and how it was just trying to be something different. If I have any complaints about the Looney Tunes show, I could do without the weird musical segments that they had. They also had some like Roadrunner CGI cartoons that I always skipped. They weren't really that bad, I just, they weren't for me. Although I'm not sure who else remembers this fever dream of a music video where Elmer Fudd basically makes love to a grilled cheese sandwich for like four minutes. It's bizarre. Yeah, 
The Looney Tunes Show is one of the most slept on cartoons of the decade and definitely I feel like deserves a spot on this list. And if you have not seen it, you definitely should check it out. What if I told you that there was a series with zero dialogue and five episodes that managed to say more than a lot of shows with dialogue and multiple seasons? That's exactly what Gendy Tarkovsky managed to pull off with Primal. Which if anyone could do this, it would be Gendy because he's proven time and time again that he is one of, if not the best in the game when it comes to visual storytelling and action and animation. All of which he puts a good use in Primal. Which follows a caveman named Spear who befriends a T-Rex named Fang after both lose their families to a pack of rogue dinosaurs. Surprisingly, being a show that was very heavily celebrated for being unapologetically violent and masculine and just being manly, there's actually a pretty heavy focus on the consequences of violence. It's almost a commentary on how what we consider traditionally masculine and the old-fashioned expectations we hold to men are actually pretty damaging and unhealthy. The way that they portray PTSD manifesting and the way that being regularly exposed to violence and killing affects the character's mental health. It wasn't just a story about the action and violence that takes place in the world. World. There was an exploration of everything around that as well, looking at the human psyche and how that's affected by loss and such graphically traumatic experiences. Which again, this is done with no dialogue, just visuals. Yet it's one of the most emotional and raw stories I've ever seen, and that's something that's hard to accomplish to this degree outside of the world of animation. We Bear Bears is a great example of a show that doesn't need a super engaging plot to be great. Because We Bear Bears is a wholesome, funny show about bears trying to understand society. But there's also this dynamic where they've been assimilated and raised in a human society with human conventions to the point where being just bears isn't natural for them. They use human technology and eat human food, and have adopted human culture as their own, finding an identity through it, but they're also bears. Though there isn't an overarching story, the show does go into the past of the bears and try to provide context for their relationships, personality quirks, just helping you understand the characters and what makes them who they are. We Bear Bears is very character driven. The world feels alive because of the attention in putting people into that world. From the bears to minor supporting characters, even to the background characters. One of the coolest things about this show is the background characters are so diverse and well designed, which is a really nice touch. Like you could just make background characters that are palette swaps of Jane and John Doe, or you could design characters where you can get a hint of what type of person they are, even if they have no lines. Because drawing is writing, image tells a story, and the visuals here tell the audience a lot about the world. It manages to capture a sense of reality through the attention to detail, while also adding positive and upbeat vibes with the show's lighthearted tone. We Bear Bears isn't revolutionary or jaw-dropping, but it delivers. It's entertaining, it's charming, and it can even be emotional at times. It's just a solid show that makes you happy, and sometimes that's all you need from a cartoon. Final Space is one of the most important cartoons to come out in this decade. The show itself is a sprawling space epic filled with adventure, humor, and heart from the genius mind of Olin Rogers, who had his start on YouTube and humbly rose the ranks all the way to getting his own TV show. In fact, it's one of the most inspiring stories in animation, and something I'd never seen happen before or since. Olin put all of his heart and effort into an incredible pilot, the pilot got seen by Conan O'Brien, cut to the show being picked up by TBS and now being successfully on its second season, going on a third. It's an incredible story and shows and anybody can have their adventure told if they try hard enough and Olin is such a hard-working creative individual It really comes off in the show another incredible thing about final space is its growth The show that follows the misadventures of Gary and the rest of his crew as he travels through space Dealing with foes and trying to solve the mystery of what final space is changed a lot from season 1 and season 2 And that's because Olin actually listened to a lot of the criticisms with season 1 He took those criticisms and he made season 2 even better In fact season 2 is almost an entirely different show for all of the right reasons it's so hard for me to give you a synopsis about what Final Space is about because it's always changing. It's always telling this incredible story. There's all these overarching plots and themes. Characters are developing, coming in and leaving in different ways. It's just a ride from start to finish and it's definitely worth a watch. If you want a show that will make you laugh and cry and also be on the edge of your seat, Final Space is definitely worth a watch. <laughs> Or 
All right, so we actually forgot one slot when initially scripting this, and I can't choose between these two shows, so they're just going to share the same slot. Amphibia is underrated because I already know it's going to be unfairly overlooked for the Owl House due to the timing of Disney scheduling in 2019 versus the return of weekly premieres they're rolling out in 2020. Amphibia follows Anne, a girl peer pressured into stealing a magic box by her two jerk friends and wind up in a magical world populated by anthropomorphic frogs. Alex Jones would shit himself. What makes Amphibia such a palate cleanser to me is that despite presenting itself as an innately story-driven show, the team decided to use that knowledge to take their time with the first season and properly set up characters over conflict. And there are a lot of characters, for the better, each providing something new for the show and generally lend more to the comedic elements of the show. A friend of mine, Wasp Ranger, aka It's Only Magic on YouTube, describes the show as Fantasy Simpsons done right, and I think that's the perfect forward blurb. The writing and jokes are on part of early Simpsons, and definitely, surprise, surprise, Gravity Falls. Because we become so intimate with the characters that it's hard not to care about what Anne is dealing with and how her predicaments affect the entire town. Look, don't play games, just watch the show. The entire first season is on Disney+. Plus. I can see it quickly ascending to God status among other story cartoons in 2020, so get on the hype train before it becomes a bit too crowded. On the other hand, there is Craig of the Creek, which started out as something referred to as Ed and Eddie mixed with Codename Pips Next Door, which the show itself caught fans out on for that comparison. But God, now that it's two seasons in, that comparison never did it any justice. Craig of the Creek doesn't care if it's grounded in reality, it'll crank things up from 0 to 100 in a moment's instance and find a way to justify it later. Later. Using what they learned from their time as head writers on Steven Universe, creators Matt Burnett and Ben Levin alongside their team provide many stories that's often overlooked in the traditional coming-of-age cartoon. Stories that remind us of the wonders of childhood, the importance of family, and sour candy eating contests, people! Craig of the Creek feels like a very down-to-earth show. Not every kid is meant to act like a kid, but rather just a human being, giving perspective and representation for all different walks of life. I'm happy this is a flagship IP for a new generation, and the hints of the bigger story with the king of the other side get me so excited to see what's next. Craig of the Creek is a gift. Every episode flies by while making the most out of 11 minutes, and it's a bit comforting knowing that the show could go on for a very long time. There have been countless Scooby-Doo interpretations and rebrands and reimaginings, but guys, Scooby-Doo Mystery Incorporated is in a league of its own, truly. I know what's new Scooby-Doo is a treasure and we're all lucky to have it, but guys, Mystery Inc., I would go out on a limb and say is the greatest Scooby-Doo series of all time. It is the quintessential Scooby-Doo series. It is a meta take on the entire Scooby-Doo story and it does everything right in a different way. It's beautiful. From the jump, from the very first episode, Scooby-Doo Mystery Inc. makes itself clear that it is a different interpretation of Scooby-Doo. It's sarcastic. It's allowing itself to get dark. It's taking a look at the gang in a realistic light. As apparent by the fact that literally in episode one, they are arrested for solving a crime. Gone are the days of simplistic villains that turn out to just be the banker from down the road. Scooby-Doo Mystery Inc. gives you all of the Scooby-Doo stuff that you love and expect, but serves it up in a realistic way with an incredible mystery and overarching plot that will keep you on the edge of your seat the entire time. A lot of people may have had gripes with the love subplots they had in the show, and honestly, I see that there. It's kind of the show's weaker point, but no other Scooby-Doo interpretation has been able to capture what makes Scooby-Doo so great, while also giving it to us in an incredibly new way. It almost makes fun of Scooby-Doo in the fact that we're all in on the joke and we all love it regardless. Take Fred's almost comical obsession with traps. It's a great running gag that just honestly is something we've all been thinking the entire time, so yeah, this works. Another incredible aspect is that it showed the relationship of these mystery-solving teams with their parents, which solved the long-ass Scooby-Doo question as how are they just affording to do this constant road trip to every mystery in America? Where are their parents? Well, they're here in this series, and they're some of the best parts of the show. There's some incredible drama with Freddy's dad being the mayor, and like I said, as the series goes on, it gets a lot trippier. The show had some serious changes in development over time, all culminating in one of the biggest and darkest endings of any Scooby-Doo series ever. And may I also point out, the fact that it had an ending is absolutely crucial. Mystery Inc. set out to tell a story, and it completed that story. It, like, told what it wanted to tell, and then it ended naturally. It was perfect. In a world where Scooby-Doo exists in this weird one-off limbo land, and for being a franchise that's so incredibly repetitive, Mystery Inc. is a breath of fresh air and just the greatest thing Scooby-Doo that's come out in such a long time. I'm glad I got to tell its story and it's actually on Netflix right now. If you want to watch it, please do if you haven't. You will not regret a single episode.
The 2010s were full of reboots, many of which faced a lot of backlash. But there's one reboot that did an amazing job at silencing the critics and coming in hard with a transformation of an old show that proved that reboots can be really great if there's a passion to use that property to tell a great new story. They can expand on the foundation of the source material to create something new and innovative, which is exactly what DuckTales did, adding depth to the characters, telling an overarching story, and bringing in new elements and questions to the show to make everything feel like it meant more. From what I've seen of the original, it was always pretty one note. They go on adventures and that's about it, just kind of your average after school, Saturday morning, bit of action, bit of adventure type of formula, which definitely worked for the time period. But here, the adventures are only a small part of the plot. There's so much more going on between the characters and a deeper exploration on why they go on adventures in the first place, or what they want from life beyond these adventures, some of the family skeletons in the closet, and the tension that comes about as a result. Background on who the characters are, what they're like, and what motivates that, which creates an emotional connection between the audience and the text that just flat out wasn't present in the source material. I don't know how a diehard DuckTales fan could watch this show and not appreciate how much more they do for the characters and the property as a whole. Like, there are so many cartoons that I grew up watching that followed a similar blueprint to the original DuckTales, and if someone came along and rehauled the world and story of those cartoons like this reboot does for DuckTales, then I would be ecstatic. But that being said, I don't think there are many fans that feel anything but love for this reboot. Legend of Korra had some very big shoes to fill following The Last Airbender, which if it aired this decade would probably be at the top of our list. But even though Korra didn't reach the same level as its predecessor, it doesn't mean that it's not very good. One of the things that stands out to me, especially with the creative new ways that bending is used, I feel like the action is just on another level in Legend of Korra, like possibly better than Last Airbender. I was making a Korra video very recently and I kept getting distracted as I was editing by how jaw-droppingly creative some of the offense is, and the direction only amplifies that. Which would make sense that a more technical element of the show would be better in the sequel series as the writing might go a bit downhill. At the very least, we do get some fan service as fans of the original series seeing a glimpse of what happened to Team Avatar and seeing how the next generation turned out through their children and grandchildren, which all have their own personalities by the way. When I think Tenzin, I don't think, ah, oh, yeah, that's Mang and Katara's son. Nah, that's Tenzin. He's his own character with his own charm and appeal. Same thing with Boomy, Kaya, Lin, Suyin, Opal. I don't even consider the fact that they're descendants of the original cast because they have their own personalities that also manage to be similar enough that it's not that far-fetched to believe that these are descendants of the original cast. I think the only exception to this is probably Zuko's grandson Iroh, but that's mainly because Dante Bosco is voicing him, so it's almost impossible to separate the two like that. But even then, that's not necessarily a bad thing because sometimes you look at people's kids and you're like, that's literally you. That's a mini you. But as I've made clear recently, I really like Korra's character arc, and even if the beats along that journey weren't always executed in the best way, I always really enjoyed how she got from point A to point B. Which if you want to hear me talk about that more in depth, go watch the video I made about it. Yeah, that's right, I'm gonna plug my video on Top 25, who's gonna stop me? Nine one one. there's been a murder. A Netflix original got apparently canceled after one season. Oh, you're a bit backed up with actual problems and other Netflix originals having an untimely death? Ah, this bit is going nowhere. Tuka and Birdie was robbed of so much. This show really connected me in a way I didn't expect. I expected Bojack through the lens of a woman, but I got a great contrast instead. A show that is through that lens, but focuses on the importance of a support system. It's nothing like Bojack and it's all for the better. It's a visual delight, redefining what it means to get weird, because weird is just normal for this show. But that weirdness and rapid fire comedy never undermines the gravity of serious situations. There's a certain episode with a certain backstory reveal. If you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. The way it was built up to and presented affected me in a way I never expected it to. A way no show touched me before. It was a wonderful show to connect with my female friends over, and I even gained a better understanding of being a woman in America. Something that I obviously won't ever be able to fully experience and understand because hey, I'm a dude! Tuka and Birdie may be gone way too soon, but its memory will live on for decades to come. It's the new Mission Hill to me, and I'll stand by that weird comparison. Okay y'all, I'm back to hype up this show with every fiber of my being because Shira and the Princesses of Power is honestly my personal favorite show of the decade. The characters, great. Story, intense. Then the themes, don't, don't get me started on all the themes or we will be here all day. 
again. In so many ways, Shira is a representation of how our culture and the medium of animation has evolved over time, taking a show originally made in the 80s to sell toys and using it now to really just go all in and tell an amazing story with layers and depth through characters who have their own personal journeys, characters who are diverse both in background and personality, characters who are flawed and walk a difficult path towards being better people or a path towards self-destruction. There's emotion, drama, ups and downs in relationships all while a younger generation takes on the mantle of deciding the fate of the world. Though the show has been criticized for being supposed leftist propaganda by including certain progressive elements. However, none of the representation or characters feel shoved in for the sake of making a political statement. In fact, the show isn't really political at all. People criticize the inclusion of LGBT plus characters, but every LGBT plus character or relationship feels organic. They don't even acknowledge these things as anything out of the norm in the text. Bo has two dads, Spinnerella and Tasa or a couple, Double Trouble is non-binary, and none of it is ever directly addressed or made into a thing. They just exist, and their characters and their personalities exist beyond those identities. Hell, Double Trouble was introduced and added so much to the story, and was the MVP of this past season in terms of getting things moving. People definitely have more reason to like them beyond the representation they offer, which only makes that representation better. I understand maybe Shira isn't reaching every demographic, and some might even feel alienated by it, but that's a case of you're never going to please everyone, and it's better to make a story that a smaller audience passionately loves than a story that everybody feels eh, sort of favorable towards, but also kind of indifferent to. But for those of us who are invested, it's because Shira does a lot of the simple things that we expect stories to do, and often feel let down when they don't. It feels in touch with what its audience wants, and even if that's divisive to some, it is what it is, and it's unapologetic about it. It's a story that doesn't compromise on what it wants to be, which has made it into one of the best. Over the Garden Wall is a flawless masterpiece. There's not a lot to say here. Ugh, oh, wait, no. I have more to say. Over the Garden Wall is as close as you can get to perfection. The show is beautiful. It tells a unique, moving, and complete story. The characters are all lovable and also complicated and they feel real. It was new, it was daring, it was its own thing. It was all at once funny, somber, and ultimately 100% itself. And it was something I had never seen before up until that point. This 10 episode miniseries spurs from the mind of Patrick McHale, formerly known for Adventure Time and Flapjack, two of the greatest Cartoon Network shows of all time. So it's no surprise Surprise, he went on to make one of his very own. The entire series was based off of the pilot he did, Tome of the Unknown, which pretty much followed the same sort of plot, about two brothers, Wirt and Greg, lost in the magical world of the unknown. This forest filled with unique characters and locations and stories. Wirt and Greg, along with a bluebird Beatrice, travel through the unknown, just trying to get home. Along the way, finding these little pockets of stories. I love shows like this, shows with a new location every episode, new characters every episode, and they totally utilize that to their advantage by telling 10 of like the most creative and original stories I've ever seen put to screen. If you were to ask me, Over the Garden Wall would be my pick for Cartoon of the Decade, if not for the fact that it was so short and there were other cartoons that have accomplished more, but the point is, it is as close as you can get to animated perfection. The voice cast is incredible, from the adorable Colin Dean voicing Greg to Elijah Wood voicing Wirt, and he does an incredible job. Wirt is one of my favorite characters in all of animation. He's all at once analytical, self-centered, but also like deeply awkward in the best way, and Greg's childish optimism makes them the perfect pair. When I first started watching this, I'm like, oh, this is like a typical magical world type scenario, a sort of storybook fable type world. And it worked incredibly well as that, but as the show goes on, it did an incredible job of subverting your expectations when you realize that Word and Greg are actually children alive in what appears to be like, I don't know, like the 50s? Definitely not current time, but definitely not storybook fable either. The fact that they left the unknown is this mystery to the audience. Where did they actually go? Was it real? They even left little clues like Jason Thunderburger actually glowing with the bell in the hospital room, pretty much confirming that the unknown is real to a certain extent. But even plot aside, this show is visually amazing. It has this sort of somber fog to all of it. And then there's music, incredible music, music that you wouldn't expect to hear. Old ragtime type songs that work the best way and fit in this format incredibly well, sung by legitimate legends. And the whole thing is just beautiful. I could gush about Over the Garden Wall forever, but the point that you need to understand is that Over the Garden Wall is just one of those flawless shows that's in a league of its own. Throughout these 10 episodes, you will feel every single emotion, and you might even cry, because honestly, I cried, dude. That children chorus at the end, 
Legend, Greg, oh my god. It just feels like a classic from the very beginning. Reoccurring characters like the Beast and the Woodsman work perfectly in with the story and build to an incredible climax at the end. It even manages to be incredibly funny. But ultimately, Over the Garden Wall is a beautiful show with a lot of heart that tells a story I didn't even know I wanted to hear. If you have not seen Over the Garden Wall, get a cup of hot apple cider, curl up on the couch with a blanket, and just watch it front to back, and I, I promise you will not regret it. The show is beautiful. All right, listen, I know Star vs. The Force of Evil was that one show not everyone was on board with. It had plenty of fans, but it had its tough critics. However, after its finale, Cleaved aired, the amount of people who turned on the entire show was kind of baffling. Look, Star vs. The Force of Evil did not have a strong ending. I think it's a little bit more than a general consensus, but I don't think it ruins what the show was up until that point. While I will stand by the final season being the weakest, even that season provided a lot of laughs, and I think that was a big strong suit of the show. It was just fun to watch for me. Although I was engrossed in the overarching story, I was utterly dissatisfied until season 4 when an episode just decided to goof around. The writing, the delivery, the visual gags, they were always on point. But at the same time, I can see how that humor could not be for everybody. Because when you break it down, Star vs. The Force of Evil was kind of the equivalent of those really funny Tumblr text posts you see reposted over and over again for the last few years. But I kind of think that's why it's so great. Humor is subjective. But I eat those Tumblr posts up just like the show. What I'm trying to say is, I think Star is a show that actually serves as a great example for what humor in the 2010s was kind of like. Beyond the nonsensical memes, sure we had those moments too in the show, but let me just dismiss that before someone tries to make a quick jab in the comments. To Star's credit though, even if the overarching story wasn't really thought out and planned from beginning to end, I really enjoyed what they did with most of it, and that's because if there's one thing the show nailed, it was the characters. It just seems as if the situations they were put in is what really irked people. If Star ever got a continuation of some kind, I do think they would benefit from damage controlling the ending, but I think more so they would benefit from mainly doing episodic adventures. Because while the the story hook did get the show pretty far, I do believe these are some of the most well-rounded high school teenage characters I've seen in a long time. Compared to the other cartoons running, characters are often in elementary or middle school or don't go to school at all. But sticking those characters in a high school setting for the first two seasons really gave us what I felt was an accurate depiction of how people in high school act. If only the show didn't go too crazy with the shipping towards the end. If only. But for all of its flaws, when I think of the 2010s, Star will stick out for me. In a good light. For that reason, I truly believe it's deserving of being on this list. The Amazing World of Gumball is an incredible cartoon and a love letter to animation as an art form. Just take one look at this show and you will be easily impressed by the countless art styles, the mixed media, and the incredibly unique character design that all come together to create the incredible world of Elmore. The show itself follows the Watterson family, specifically Gumball and Darwin, best friends who also happen to be a cat and a fish, as they go about their lives in this crazy world interacting with a colorful and memorable cast of characters, but like a lot of other shows on this list, it is so much more than than what it is on paper. The Amazing World of Gumball is one of those shows that's managed to just get better with time. As the show went on, it understood its characters more, it got better with its writing, and it became one of the sharpest and funniest shows on television. And often no show did a tasteful pop culture reference like Gumball did. There's just so much effort put into this show, and you can tell from watching any episode. Not only is it visually amazing, but the show itself is equally as impressive, and ultimately Gumball is the full package. To say that the show just centers on Gumball and would be doing a big disservice to it, in fact, we get to know all of the characters incredibly well. From Gumball Ball's parents, to their sister Anais, to Banana Joe, and even some new characters as the show progresses. And it's just so genuinely funny, it can be enjoyed by everybody, I feel comfortable showing Gumball to anybody I know, and I know they'll love it. That's why it deserves a spot on this list. Some shows are criminally underrated, and then some are just murdered in cold blood, taken for granted, gone before its time, and overall just deserve so much better. Okay, KO, Let's Be Heroes, created by Ian Jones Cordy, is by far a series that fits that criteria. I think the attention it got from its abundance of crossovers and social commentary on gun control kind of gave the impression it was full of references, wacky off model drawings, and nothing else of substance, but that is so far from the truth. OKKO OK is a labor of love to the things that inspired not just Ian Jones Cordy, but his entire team through the best way possible. Comedy. KO is a 6 or 11 year old boy with latent power in a world where virtually everyone is a superhero, gaining employment at Guards Bodega, ran by Mr. Gar, a former teammate of KO's mother, Carol. 
Lakewood Plaza as a whole is full of so many wonderful characters that all have something to offer, but the bodega is where a lot of episodes begin and end, as we tend to chaos day-to-day -day duties with its co-workers and new best friends, Rad and Enid. With that setup, the show goes balls to the walls with how crazy it can get. So many unique premises that just wouldn't have worked with any other show. KO uses its world and wacky logic to its advantage, cranking up the insanity each season. While it was cut short, the third season was able to wrap up the main story at hand, which ultimately serviced the show really well. While I would give anything for more of the show, the finite three-act treachery it was dealt causes the characters to constantly grow, endure change, and become better people. Those arcs are a lot more rewarding because of it. The overarching story is goofy, no doubt about that, yet it has moments that I still find compelling. Plenty of scenes that give me chills that I still rewatch randomly in the middle of the night. And a... Okay, pretty much all the time. While KO does service fans of Cartoon Network with... Fan service, it's never really the focus. Those episodes stand out because they're made to stand out. But when I think of KO, I think of Denny not being qualified for a pile card because she's a Kappa, Lord Boxman pining for the sales and affection of Professor Venomous, KO's daddy issues, wacky shenanigans around the plaza, and the rampant character quirks that pumped the show with so much more life than it already had. Okay, KO has the charm of a mid 2000s web series with the talent and strength of seasoned animation professionals that combine to give it a unique atmosphere that will never be duplicated. Nothing will even come close to what the show put off, and I'll always be here, watching, waiting, for the day the show comes back for round two on HBO Max. Or it'll stay dead. But I'm not ready to deal with that reality yet. Listen, if there's one thing the 2010s pulled off exceedingly well, it was re-establishing that cartoons aren't solely for children, even if they're on a children's network aimed at a young demographic. Okay, those factors kind of feed the point of what I was saying, but regular show! This stemmed from a short of two gas station cashiers tripping balls on drugs. It's innately got some adult tones interwoven into the DNA. Regular show follows the work ethic of Mordecai and Rigby or alternatively, lack of a work ethic, as these 20-something inserts work at a park with a colorful cast of characters. Regular show was so hardcore, they had to dub over season one potty words like pissed and crotch. Yeah, this is premium edge, the kind of shit you won't find in a YMCA DVD collection. Regular show was my favorite carnivoric show for such a long time. It took the greatest Achilles heel found society, laziness, and mix it in with doses of nostalgia and basically unrestricted storytelling, inserting replacements for obvious alcohol and drug references, baking it into one gigantic cake. Regular show definitely got a bit too real with the adult life with a drawn out romance subplot, but honestly, I rewatched the show this year and it wasn't that bad in hindsight. I think the weekly airing schedule just made it feel a bit more dragged out than it really was. The final season goes for a bit more story-driven narrative, changing the status quo, and sticking the characters in space. And while I love how they were still able to maintain the goofy tone, the series finale is by far one of the most insane and heartbreaking conclusions I've ever seen on television beyond the medium of animation. The spirit of regular show is sure to live on in the next line of its evolution, close enough, which, after countless delays, will finally be one of the faces of the new decade through HBO Max. Unless the service as a whole gets delayed, or close enough isn't a launch title. In that case, eh, just rewatch regular show until it's out. Listen, all of these shows are unique, but the story of Infinity Train is something I hold close to my heart. Fall 2016, the pilot goes up on Card Network's YouTube channel and blows up. Everyone is in love with this pilot, with the characters, with the mysterious train and number on Tulip's hand, and all we wanted were answers. Nearly three years later, we finally got a few of them with Infinity Train Book 1, The Perennial Child. That is the full name for the first 10 episodes that give us a complete journey of Tulip Olsen, a child of divorce who, overwhelmed with grief and change, runs away from home and gets snatched up by the Infinity Train. I'm not gonna act like what the numbers mean were some grand revelation that no one could have seen coming, or that Tulip's resolve wasn't obvious from the beginning, but those elements all feed into the emotional core of the show, and that's what pulls at the heartstrings. Every other episode of Book 1 had me choke up or hold back tears, because as a child of divorce, I resonated with Tulip's struggles. Yet, all of this is only elevated by the overarching story that will bridge future installments. The excellent humor that constantly jumps between wacky visual gags and tongue-in-cheek exchanges that feel like you're in the room with real people, and the backgrounds. Man, oh man, the backgrounds are beautiful. 
Many people were under the impression that these hard-hitting 10 episodes would be all we got, but I always had a hunch there was more, as backed by our archive of conspiracy videos. Surprise, surprise, Infinity Train was far from a miniseries, but rather an anthology series, and this is what cements it as one of the greatest of the 2010s. Book 1 managed to gut-punch the audience and get up with kids, teens, and even adults who went through similar experiences to have endured, but I'm excited to see what comes next, what other tough topics that future main characters will face for other viewers to connect with. Please support Infinity Train, rewatch book one, or if you haven't already, check it out for the first time, and certainly watch book two, Crack Reflection, premiering January 6th through the 10th on Cartoon Network. That wasn't sponsored, I just want this show to succeed. <laughs>where do I start with Rick and Morty? This is this is going to be a hard one. Rick and Morty is the most unique cartoon that has come out in the last decade. I'm just gonna say it. I'm not gonna say it's the best. I'm not gonna say it's anything other than the fact that it is entirely Rick and Morty, and it's made itself very clear about that since day one. For a show that started out as an over-the-top parody, resulting from a cease and desist letter that Justin Roiland got from Bill Cosby's lawyers, turned into the biggest animated phenomenon in recent years in the craziest way. Sure, Rick and Morty is this huge thing now, but when it first started, it was just this weird show on Adult Swim that was honestly a little gem. When it first came out, it was consistently fresh and funny and ultimately just incredibly unique. I had never seen a show like this and a lot of people hadn't either. From the weird voices to how the pupils were drawn, to the incredibly complicated but also entirely entertaining and thought-provoking sci-fi concepts as one of the most genuinely funny and original shows in such a long time. It's just crazy to think about. Rick and Morty continued on this uproar spiral all the way through the end of season two where it hit its genuine peak. The season two finale of Rick and Morty was unmatched and just left everyone on the edge of their seats. At this point, Rick and Morty was the best show on TV. You could not convince me otherwise and it could do no wrong in my and then we went through season 3. I understand why people's view on Rick and Morty was shifted and changed during this time. Not only was it coming into the limelight as a huge, massive show, it went from being this underground adult swim thing that people would talk about online to something that like your mom potentially knew about and it was the weirdest thing ever. Add on top of that all of the scandals with McDonald's Szechuan sauce and one copy pasta that went way too far, the internet seemed to turn on Rick and Morty and the show was not doing itself any favors, neither were the fans of the show. I'm not even gonna mention Pickle Rick. You just you know how that went. It was hard to see, especially with the fact that season 3 was turning out to be the weakest season of Rick and Morty up until that point. It almost seemed like the show was about to fall off, but it didn't. Rick and Morty pushed on and got over the stigmas, it just kept going on, and after a very long hiatus, we've been greeted with five of the best episodes we've seen of the show in such a long time. I don't think Rick and Morty could handle how big it got. It was never meant to be this giant phenomenon that it turned out to be, but it seems like they finally have a grasp of what they wanted to be, and honestly, it's just gonna keep being Rick and Morty. It's very clear with these five episodes, they're just doing things their own way and they don't care anymore. And more power to them. In my opinion, the story about a genius scientist and his grandson going on misadventures, paired with Justin Roiland's weird energy and Dan Harmon's incredible storytelling, is too good to fail. Rick and Morty will continue on as long as it does, and I'm sure it will be consistently great because it has been for such a long time. And love or hate Rick and Morty, you cannot deny the impact that it's had, especially on pop culture, and Rick and Morty is still to this day one of the most incredibly unique TV shows to come out, and Rick and Morty's ability to be so entirely Rick and Morty is something that I really respect. I mean, this show built a lore off of two characters. It's insane. That's why it deserves a spot on this list. Love it or hate it, you cannot deny that Rick and Morty is something truly special. It's certainly no surprise that we think Stevie Universe is one of the best animated series of the past decade. It's beyond Hall of Fame status at this point, and truly became a cultural phenomenon all in its own. When the series premiered in 2013, I don't believe anyone could have predicted what was to come. The chronicles of a young half-human, half-alien boy living with three sentient rocks of humanoid forms really could have gone either of two ways. One route being wacky episodic stories that make us laugh and teach us a moral at the end of every 11 minutes, and the other route could take this show in a much more serious direction, telling a compelling story that makes us confront what it means to be human. Surprise! The show manages to do both. And in both aspects, it mostly stuck the landing, with a few misses here and there. Despite the high and mighty off-model critiques, which I would really chalk up to Rough Draft Korea, the show that animates about half episodes every season, the storyboards often knock it out of the park, and the raw boards tend to floor me. The backgrounds are beautiful while slightly coloring outside the lines, which I always looked at as a sprinkle of childlike wonder, the music's in a league of its own, there is no other cartoon soundtrack that sounds like it, and the voice acting has always been incredible, but it just gets better and better each season. 
Odds. Stevie Universe is a television series that constantly has had the odds stacked against it and its crew. Serialization not exactly being a meal ticket. A large sum of cooks in the kitchen. Fans and online critics who don't know how a cartoon is made. And above all else, censorship. Or more so, the fight to evade censors. What stands out the most about Steven Universe is its representation. And I mean beyond sexuality. Mental health? Trauma? Estranged families? And of course the gender binary. The storytelling is so versatile at exploring the human condition. The achievements of the series cannot be undermined. Ultimately, when it came between the show going on for a longer period of time, or showcasing a wedding between two characters, Ruby and Sapphire, losing funding from conservative countries, Rebecca Sugar ultimately chose the wedding, even if it meant losing everything else. To say the show goes for easy brownie points is borderline delusional. Its run is about to come to a finite conclusion with the limited epilogue series Steve Universe Future, but between all five seasons of the original series, Series, the movie, and future, Steven will be remembered as a titan of animation for years to come. Okay, there's no way that we can talk about the best cartoons of the decade without mentioning Adventure Time. This show was what paved the way for the 2010 renaissance in Western animation, and really changed the direction of the medium as a whole. It dared to challenge kids by integrating continuity and more serious themes into a cartoon where that wasn't expected. It dared to expand on the world of a silly cartoon and have lore and world building, but it managed to integrate these things while maintaining the traits of a mostly lighthearted cartoon, which was done with magic massive success. Adventure Time walked so every other show on this list could run, and in its prime, Adventure Time did some running too. Of course, we all know as the show went on, a lot of us lost interest, but there were plenty of highlights throughout its lifetime. If I can be subjective for a moment and give my favorite parts, I personally really love everything they did with Marceline. Everything between her and Simon that acted as a parallel to a loved one developing Alzheimer's, the Stakes miniseries, numerous bops, and in the end, she stole Finn's girl. Well. One of them anyways, Finn was kind of a hoax. Maybe Adventure Time would be eclipsed by better shows, but the fact that Adventure Time inspired most of those shows says a lot about what it meant to this past decade of animation. I don't think there's another cartoon that made such a strong cultural impact in the last 10 years, and if there is, it's probably thanks to the platform that Adventure Time built for it, creating a better environment for these stories to be told in a way that explores their full potential. You can say a lot about Adventure Time, its story, its writing, but what you can't deny is how much it accomplished in the bigger picture. Picture. Bojack Horseman is one of the most monumental cartoons of the decade, and it's also historic for a lot of reasons. It was Netflix's first toe dip into the world of animation, and one of its first originals overall. And I'm not gonna lie, when I first saw the posters for this on like Netflix circa 2013, I'm like, that looks stupid. And on paper, Bojack Horseman is nothing like it actually is. The show about a washed up 90s sitcom actor who also happens to be a humanoid horse, dealing with substance abuse and depression in modern day Hollywood, is one of the strangest concepts for any thing I have ever heard, period. But it was perfect for Netflix, and it was perfect for the time it came out, whose whole MO was being experimental and weird. They took a chance on the show, and it paid off. Since it's come out, Bojack Horseman has received critical acclaim and a mass following. It is a huge hit, and one of the reasons why I love this past decade of animation, where a show about a humanoid horse sitcom actor could become as big as it did. But Bojack Horseman is way more than just a concept on paper. What it's turned into is incredible. This show has managed to tell incredibly true and powerful stories about life and human relationships and living with yourself and loving yourself and hating yourself and dealing with your inner demons, becoming better as a person, while also touching on the trappings of fame, while providing a brilliant critique on modern Hollywood and what it means to be a celebrity in our modern time. The show is all at once touching and beautiful, but also incredibly hilarious and sharp. Seriously, Bojack Horseman is one of the best, if not the best, written cartoon currently on television, and I will die for that opinion. I dare anybody to challenge me on that. Seriously, because the show's ability to balance serious moments with funny moments, while telling a story that's all at once truthful and powerful but also incredibly entertaining, I could go on forever. All of the characters, Todd, Diane, Princess Carolyn, Mr. Peanut Butter, they all come into their own. The show may be called Bojack Horseman, but it's not solely about him, and I pride the show on dealing with all of the characters on an almost equal playing field as we get to watch them all change over the course of the series in different ways, for better and for worse. Bojack Horseman is not afraid to get incredibly dark, and in fact has many times, but it always brings it back around and keeps the audience 
wanting more. That's why I'm so sad it was canceled and that this season's his last, but in the very least, that solidifies BoJack Horseman as a legendary show. Luckily, we're seeing it end before it has the chance to get bad, but no, season six is one of the greatest seasons the show has ever had. It knows its characters more than ever. It knows exactly what it's trying to be, what it wants to be, and I'm just excited to see how they finish it with the second half of season six. And when it finally does wrap up, BoJack Horseman will be remembered as one of the greatest cartoons not only of the decade, but of all time. I I'm just gonna say it. Gravity Falls was the greatest cartoon of the last decade, hands down. And if you don't agree, let me try to persuade you. For being a show that's only had two seasons and less than 50 episodes, Gravity Falls was a phenomenon. It was more than just a show you watched, it was a show you participated in. It was an adventure we were all on together. The simple story of Dipper and Mabel spending the summer in Gravity Falls, Oregon with their crazy grunkle turned into an incredible mystery adventure that I, along with many others, will never forget. At its core, Gravity Falls is just a perfect TV show. Everything from the incredibly sharp writing, to the beautiful backgrounds of Gravity Falls, to the incredible world building, and incredibly thought-provoking high-concept supernatural adventures. But Gravity Falls was doing more than just entertaining. This wasn't going to be some one-off show. Instead, they opted to tell an incredibly complicated and weaving narrative throughout the entire series, and incredible mystery that keeps you on the edge of your seat the entire time. From the jump, from the very first episode when Dipper finds that journal, you are hooked. And the show does a great job of keeping you hooked all the way through the end of the series. But it's not just the fact that they included a mystery in this show, it's the fact that there's so much detail put into every single frame. From Bill Cipher being seen casually throughout the show, before his reveal, to the picture that flashes at the end of the theme song. And watching the show live as it aired was a journey. Every episode was a huge event. And the show was blessed with an incredible community of people all dedicated to discovering the mysteries and the secrets of the show. Gravity Falls brought people together, it created a community. Meanwhile, the show kept consistently delivering, showcasing some of the greatest storytelling I've seen in any show, period. Gravity Falls had its lighthearted moments, but it also had its dark moments. It was never afraid to get serious when it had to. There was layers to the show. And not to say that other shows didn't do that, I understand that, but what makes Gravity Falls so special is how they did it. I mean, look, Alex Hirsch literally photoshopped a fake image of the author just to throw fans off the track. If that doesn't just perfectly depict how crazy Gravity Falls was, I don't know what will. Gravity Falls was more than just a flawless TV show. It was an experience, an experience that continued on after the episode ended, and continues to this day. And that's why I think it's the greatest cartoon of the past decade. All right, now for some quick honorable mentions. This may include some movies, some cartoons you may feel were overlooked that we really enjoyed this decade. Maybe we didn't have time to check all of it out, so we couldn't dedicate it to a full slot. Whatever the case, let's do this. My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, Harvey Peak, Samurai Jack Season 5, Disenchantment, Clarence, Spider-Man to the Spider-Verse, The How to Train Your Dragon, Trilogy, the Hotel Transylvania movies are pretty neat, One Over Yonder, Hilda, Voltron before it got really bad, Generator Rex, Ben 10 Omniverse, Kick Batowski, Koopo and the Two Strings, I really enjoyed Mad, Ugly Americans, and shout out to all the wonderful anime that came out this decade, you guys qualify too. The cartoon versus anime distinction is an invisible barrier. I know you're wondering, who made this tasty ass thumbnail? And well, the credit belongs to My Cat Issue, which you can find them on Tumblr and Instagram. Instagram and Twitter at my cat issue. Pretty straightforward. Go give them a follow and some support. Maybe even throw some commissions this way. Eh, eh, eh. Well, guys, there you have it. As we close on one decade of animation and enter another, it's sad to say goodbye to a whole decade of animation, but it's just as exciting to welcome in a whole new era. Some of these shows on this list will continue to go on into 2020 and beyond, and with plenty of incredible new shows on the horizon, it looks like animation is only going to continue to improve and get even better as this decade goes on, and honestly, I couldn't be more excited for it. But that being said, I want to know what you guys think about all of this. Do you agree with our picks? Do you think there's one we left off or one that you don't agree with? Let us know in those comments down below or tweet to us at Roundtable Vids or me at Retro Nemo. As always, if you want to consider helping out the Roundtable, you could become a member of the channel or support us on Patreon to get exclusive access to scripts and avatars. As always, if you enjoyed this video, Video, make sure to give it a like, share it, and subscribe to the Roundtable for more incredible cartoon content. I'm Nebo, and this is the Top 25, and I will see you next time. Peace, Happy New Year's.